The second movement to contrast in E minor is by far the most difficult to to play. It's only 35 measures out of 133. So if you look at it, you might think, well, it's just a small portion of the piece, and, and that's true, but it has a lot of chromaticism. It has a lot of non-traditional harmonies and voice leading, and to get your students to be able to to internalize what's going on so that they can externalize in form of in-tune sound with the appropriate musical effect is going to be more challenging. There's a lot of fluid harmony. Some of it's circle of fifths. Some of it's a variation of circle of fifths. Some of it is just what it is. The tempo is fluid. There's tempo changes indicated quite a bit. That just keeps the keeps it going and going and going. There are very few cadential points. Um, there are very few cadence areas. We've got this here and here and and here, but but really, um, it's just everything's just set in motion and everything is just kind of going forward. And really, where's our home base? Listening through this, like for for some people, it's going to be really hard to even determine what key we're in because there's so much activity going on, so much chromaticism. From a practical point of view, this is going to make it difficult to have your players playing in tune, but there are some strategies that we can use to help with that. But first, I, I just want to go over the harmonic breakdown of what's happening here, and that way if you want to go in and build some chords and construct you know, root third, fifth, seventh, whatever you need to do, that we're on the same page as far as what, which harmonies are where and which are the chord tones and what are the non-chord tones so the students can have something to latch on to and, and kind of tune the harmonies as they're happening measure by measure. That might be an effective practice strategy for developing quality intonation and contrast in E minor. So right here at the Dolce section, we start off with something that appears to indicate G major, which goes into a... C major seventh chord. So the chord tones that we're going to be tuning are, of course, C here, the E, which is the third, and then we eventually go down to an E here, then the B, which is the seventh of the chord. And, and then we have uh, some non-chord tones there too. So making sure that we get the, the C, the root of the chord in tune is important, and the third, and then stacking that major seventh which is going to be a half step away from the root. Then we're going to go into an F sharp half diminished seventh. So we have a circle of fifths progression. We have G down to C, and then instead of going down to F, it's F sharp. Okay, and then F sharp to B, B minor, we get that circle of fifths progression again. But then B minor to E flat major. So instead of B to E, it's B to E flat. E flat to A flat. And but then instead of A flat to D flat, it's A flat to D and then D to G. So sometimes it's a perfect fifth and sometimes it's diminished fifth uh, as we're moving down the circle of fifths sort of anti-clockwise around the circle. All right, in measure 50, our harmonic rhythm picks up quite a bit and we start to get some root movement by third, which provides more common tones, but we also have a, a lot of stepwise motion, you know, for some passing tones and so forth. Because of this um, dotted quarter note, eight, three eighth rhythm. So that, that provides some movement, some opportunity for non chord tones. Um, in this section, our, our violas have the melody. So we can, uh, and, and our first violins aren't playing, although they do have cues. If you don't have enough violas, you can have your first violins play those cues to help reinforce it. Or even in the rehearsal situation, you might want to have your first violins play also just to have something to do if you're going through this section so they're not just sitting when you're working on this. But we go from our, our harmonic rhythm increases. We go from E minor to B minor to F major to A major to D major, or D minor, sorry, to F major to G minor. For most of this section, we're going to have a lot of root movement by third. 
but whenever we have root movement by by step, we have a lot of instances of non-traditional voice leading here, where, for instance, in the upper cello part, as it's been divided here, we have this F coming up to a G, and in the second violin part, we have the C natural coming up to the D, so we have these uh, parallel perfect fifths here with F to C, and then G to D, and that's going to create some challenges, and we'll talk about that later. We slow the harmonic rhythm back down as we go to E flat major here. We start to get faster and louder, and then we go to A7, and then we slow down. We go to D major, then B minor, then C minor, eventually to D minor 7 as we change meter and get faster, and we, we keep that harmony, that D7 harmony, all the way until we end up with this E flat 7 chord, back to B7, then a C, C minor 7th, and finally we return to G again, um, as we had right at the beginning. So we do get a taste of G minor here for a couple measures, but for the most part, yeah, we, we get a little bit of it here at, at E as well with this cadential point, but we don't get a lot of, of emphasis on cadences that go into G major. We get sort of a half cadence here that goes into a D7 a little bit, um, but there, there are not a lot of cadences to latch onto, and, and that's part of what makes this challenging. Again, as we go through, we can isolate the chords and take out the non-chord tones so the students get stuff to latch onto and they can kind of hear the harmonic progressions. There's also some patterns in the chromaticism. For instance, um, at E here, we have half step steps um, in the uh, second violin part. So we'll have some chromaticism that's a half step and then it'll resolve to the root of the next chord. So, so we have um, D sharp and then resolve into to E. Um, and then right here, we've got the same thing, C sharp, that's resolved into D. And we have this pattern that kind of works out again and again. So when we're having these notes, okay, well, we got to play a low one here, we got to play a high three here, it, it kind of, we can kind of show them where those chromatic pitches are, are, are leading to, and that can help them tune. We can also teach them how they're functioning in these chords. We can show them how. Um, the C sharp is functioning as the third of this A major chord here because we have A sharp C. We still have the the F that's being suspended here, but but we can show them exactly what's happening here and how it's going into this D minor chord here with the F natural and the cellos it's being held over. I think we can get into this misconception that all of these composers from the common practice era just got together and said, oh, we should do this and we should do that and just come up with all these rules. And to some extent, you know, they, they had some treatises and they had some, some councils where they met on some stuff. But again, it was more from a, a functional, sort of more of a liturgical um, point of view and not necessarily from, from a musical point of view. So, so where did all these ideas come from with, with voice leading rules and a lot of them come from natural order. And if you look at the introduction sequence to, to teaching orchestra, you'll, you'll see some, some images there. We'll, you'll see like the, the Fibonacci sequence and how that relates to, to pitch and then how the, the pitches relate to our instruments and, and the scrolls. They're all the same shape and they all have the, the same practical meaning. So we're going from mathematics to functional pitch and frequency to deliberate art. So we have that layer that we have the, the fundamental layer of universal physics. And then we have the frequency application of that as it relates to sound. And then we have the artistic expression. So part of the reason why we have a natural order and we have traditional voice leading rules is because of the, the frequency of notes and as they appear in nature and how those frequencies 
interact with each other and, and resolve in certain ways. When we depart from these natural tendencies, what happens is the music becomes more abstract. And the further we depart from the natural order, the more abstract the music becomes. Now, music can already be fairly abstract. You know, we have uh, program music and we have absolute music, and that already has a layer of abstraction to it. Whereas something like Romeo and Juliet, you know, we have a program to follow and we can put characters in place and we can create scenery in our minds, and, and this, is, this is very abstract. My suggestion, and for some of you this might be a little out there, but for me and, and my students, it, it works. If I, if I have something that's too abstract, well, then I make it more programmatic. Okay, so how do we do this? We come up with a program. What does this mean? You know, let's get back to our values on the hierarchy of techniques. Let's get back to our values. What does this mean? Let's circle back there and, and, and build from that. There's different ways that you might want to accomplish this. You could play it for them, play a recording for the students. Okay, what are you thinking about? What does this mean to you? What do you feel? What, what do you see? What kind of landscape is, is there? Okay, you could have a contest with your students and say, all right, I want you to come up with a comic strip that represents these 35 measures. What's happening here? Who are the characters? Where are they? What are they doing? And then your students can vote and see which one they like the best. And you can line up the comic strip with the music and get them to start to visualize and come up with what's going on. And that way their, their music means something. So now you've taken an abstract, through-composed, harmonically fluid piece of music and you've transformed it into something like a film score. And that may not be what Fies intended. It's probably not. But again... It gives them a direction to use their mus musicianship. And, and, and a lot of times we need to be able to lead with our musicianship and then the technique will follow, maybe not the other way around. I mean, yes, it's good to build chords. Yes, it's good to practice finger patterns and play long tones and, you know, root, third, root fifth, third, seventh. You know, we can be architects here and put on a construction hat and start building all this stuff up or... We could go into creative mode, you know, musician mode, and figure out what this is about and draw that out of us, and our technique will follow. And I think for a lot of students and a lot of orchestras, that's going to be the best strategy for this second moment. My students love to play film scores, especially um, my non-varsity orchestra students. You know, the, they, they, they love to play the film scores, and they love to tell that story. And, and here, we can give them an opportunity to, same, to do the same thing. We can have them tell this story. But first, we gotta, we got to come up with the story. Overall, this movement is going to take the most amount of time to make this whole work sound good. You're going to be spending most of your rehearsal time from D to G. The good news is the next video on the third movement much easier to put together. It's, in my opinion, the easiest of the three, and it's also a lot of fun. So look out for the next video, and I'll see you then.